The impact of Trump's immigration policies have been have been devastating for immigrant communities, uh, including the folks that are already in the United States and the folks that want to make their way to the United States, right? Um, and I think it maybe it's good to take a minute to kind of to kind of keep in mind that Trump's immigration policies affect a broad range of of immigrants. Um, of course, undocumented immigrants uh, that have long been the targets of his anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric and policy making, but also refugees and asylum seekers, um, also legal immigrants, so folks that maybe want to come to the United States as a legal permanent resident that have a you know that aspire to get a green card, um, also immigrants that want to come on um, a temporary work permit or you know temporary work visa like an H1B visa which are visas for for high skilled high skilled workers and more recently international students international students that are already in the United States so this is just to say that um, foreign born individuals who are not citizens of the United States um, none of them are safe from Trump's anti-immigrant policy making The, the managed entry system, as, as the Hungarian border uh, protection fence and the asylum system could be described uh, as, is a really perverted um, way of, of dealing with um, the challenges of, of, of spontaneous arrivals of, of asylum seekers. And over time, um, in the years of 20, from 2015 until today, basically the Hungarian policy uh, became to be built on uh, barring effective access to the territory, barring effective access to the asylum procedure, instituting automatic and indefinite detention of asylum seekers in these border transit zones, and even uh, by creating a so-called mass migration uh, crisis, a legal framework that is short of an emergency uh, legal order, but but certainly gives way to a lot of of extraordinary and non-transparent measures. Um, this legal framework also resulted in, for example, the automatic and indefinite detention of unaccompanied minors who are over 14 years of age. The impact on nonprofits in the, the United States working on immigration has been extraordinary. A lot of us, including the Center for Constitutional Rights, have moved to file lawsuits. I haven't counted, but there may be more lawsuits pending against this administration in the first three and a half years than any other administration in US history. With Trump and his anti-immigrant and mass deportation agenda, these organizations are now very much on the defensive. Um, and a lot of energy and time is spent on fighting uh, the impact of those policies and to stop those policies from having that negative impact. So, um, and a lot of organizations find themselves fighting one immigration crisis that's fabricated by Trump after another. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's very um, exhaustive for these organizations to do this kind of work. Um, it is, I think, emotionally and physically draining for these organizations. Some organizations do find ways to, to innovate, to come up with new programs along the way, and some new organizations have been created to respond to the situation that we're in now. But it's actually interesting to ask what this succession of immigration crises that are that are created by Trump, what they do for um, kind of the longevity, the long-term health and the vitality of this sector of organizations. In uh, 2017, as, uh, as, as this anti-NGO uh, narrative was culminating, the government decided to to propose legislation to Parliament, which was adopted because the Fidesz-led uh, uh, coalition has a super majority in, in the Hungarian Parliament, the legislation targeted 
civil society organizations that receive funding from abroad. Uh, very much, I must say, built along the, the Russian Foreign Agent Act. And after the election uh, in um, April 2018 yielded the, again, a supermajority in parliament for the Fidesz-led coalition, legislation was passed as a sort of second step in, um, in shrinking civil society space. Uh, and this legislation criminalized assisting uh, asylum seekers. This, didn't, this um, did not deter any organization from providing assistance to their clients. But as the second leg of this Stop Shores le legislation focused on organizations receiving funding for what was deemed to be pro-immigration purposes, and it levied a 25% tax on this funding, a lot of organizations had to really look into their activities. So there's a discussion happening right now in the um, nonprofit world around two defense strategies. One is with respect to the administration, making sure um, and monitoring whether there is a discussion about uh, creating rules that limit NGO access to uh, their clients. Uh, this happens sometimes, for example, if you try to get into an immigration detention facility, um, particularly where the children were being held, impossible to get in there without uh, a court order. It's the same thing with Guantanamo. They wouldn't let us into Guantanamo because it was a Department of Defense facility, even though we were representing clients. So that's been happening already. I do fear that there will be a crackdown on NGOs moving forward, uh, particularly around questions of access to um, to the people that they need access to, uh, to we will expect that they will be demonizing uh, nonprofit organizations for you know working against America. That happened under the Bush administration, but it was actually more the the conservative lobby that was doing that work rather than the presidential administration. But I think this is going to come from the presidential administration. And the second thing that we're working on the defensive about is. Um, the right wing movement that has already um, started to threaten NGOs based upon the work that they're doing. So we've had our website attacked a number of times. We've had to put in more security mes mechanisms uh, to be able to, um, to keep our staff safe from those types of attacks. Uh, we have people that are monitoring 4chan. There's a lot of discussion uh, in these deep parts of the web that are really some of the more dangerous pieces that we're concerned with. The chilling effect is probably the intended impact of these uh, laws. It's very important to highlight how the chilling effect has become uh, a tool for um, illiberal governments around the world, but already within the European Union. And it's extremely uh, important to understand how the chilling effect is, uh, is the, the, the manifestation of, of, of these anti-human rights policies. But the chilling effect is visible when it comes to, for example, um, many people saying that it's difficult for them to share a social media post by the Helsinki Committee or similar organizations because they fear that this could be noticed by their employer. This is particularly worrying when it comes to public sector employees who feel that there's a risk attached to their expression of, op of an opinion. It, it might not even be a political opinion. It might be sharing you know, a Facebook post about uh, a personal story, but but the uh, but the chilling ef effect is really the intended impact. So it's not that um, um, the political interest is in creating um, martyrs out of human rights lawyers by throwing them in prison, like in Turkey, but rather by by silencing the the support networks 
around the social the, the the social support for the causes and the organization. Mm-hmm.